Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby here with Charlie Rosen and Brian Carter, the Some Like It Hot orchestrators. Congratulations to you both on uh, getting nominated for a Tony this year. Charlie, you've won a Tony previously for Moulin Rouge. And Brian, this is your first nomination. What has it been like experiencing this season together? Well, you know, like you said, this is no, not my first rodeo. I, I've been nominated two times before and I've won once before. But the, the season I won for was the season during COVID. So obviously that was a very <laughs> unconventional Tony season, to put it lightly. Uh, you know, and, and the parties were canceled and all the lead ups were canceled and the interviews and the galas and the, this, all the rigmarole that goes with it. So this is the first time I've really uh, fully, I think now Broadway being more fully back, fully experienced like the full force of the Tony run up and all the excitement and buzz that goes with it, you know? Definitely. And Brian, what has it been like for you? What was it like when you found out? Well, this is my first rodeo. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's been really cool. It's been really, uh, really fun. I got to have like an ugly cry on the train while talking to my mom. You know? <laughs> uh, all the things you look forward to when you're nominated for, you know, a statue. And I get to hang out with my best friend. I don't have to like, you know, do it alone. I get to go to uh, all the press events and do interviews with Charlie while he's at the zoo. And I'm in my studio. <laughs> yeah, it's honestly more fun to do it as a pair because it's like you have somebody that you can sort of like, uh, you know, commiserate with and talk about it with and share in the, the glory, you know, it's cool. Well, that's something I've noticed too about there are many pairs of people who work together as orchestrators what is kind of the biggest what's the biggest benefit to you of having a collaborator for this type of work yeah i'll go first again if that's cool right i mean it's up to you uh but um you know i mean i i think the the cool thing about being part of like a group of orchestrators as opposed to a solo orchestration is a few things i mean a first of all orchestrating a broadway show is an absolutely mammoth job like it is a massive undertaking there's so much music in a show there's and if you have a big orchestra there's so many instruments to write for and so especially a show of this scale splitting it you know having somebody else collaborating with you just takes so much pressure off of one person to deliver that much music first of all second of all at, there, at a certain point in the show's development i was the sole orchestrator on the show uh and then you know they asked me to bring on a collaborator and the show is big band and it's like a it takes place in a time and a place. And, uh, you know, I could think of no better person I would want to, you know, collaborate this on the show with than Brian, because Brian has such an encyclopedic knowledge of jazz and big man. He's an educator on the subject. And so when they asked me to bring on another orchestrator to help out, I mean, he was the obvious choice. And, you know, we have very Venn diagrams of skill sets that uh, where we overlap in a lot of ways and we don't, and we can check each other's work and he can give me suggestions. I can give it to him. It, I think it makes for a more fruitful and varied and rich orchestration when you have people with different skill sets and musical backgrounds and vocabularies collaborating on the same thing. It keeps it really exciting, you know? Absolutely. Um, I mean, even, even just now, like today, we're working on these, uh, it's really weird as an orchestrator, you know, if if someone from your show wins, then you're like, it's your orchestration that's that the orchestra is playing. That plays you on, yeah. yeah. So we're doing those and you know, I, I send, you know, one of the cues over to Charlie and I'm like, what do you think of this? And he's like, well, man, maybe, you know, the brass here will be too heavy, you know, so or they need like a little break. So maybe cut these two bars of brass so that the French horn can like peek through, you know, just like little suggestions like that. And, and the only reason I made that suggestion is because I know from doing the Tonys that it's a cue that they're when you play, you know, when you win a Tony, they repeat the same like loop of a song over and over and over and over. And so I just knew that like, oh, when we record this, they're going to have to play this like seven or eight times in a row. So just to make sure that they don't pass out, maybe just because I know this from doing this before, you know, I mean, it's like things like that, where it's like very symbiotic. So I've, I've never done a Tony recording session with the Tony orchestra before. So it's like, you know, it's a, a sharing of skill sets and a, a sharing of information. Yeah, very cool. Um, uh, speaking of that jazz age sound you were talking about, which this musical is steeped in. Uh, Mark Shaman told me earlier this season that he wanted it to sound like a big classic MGM musical, uh, which it very much does. What is, was that the brief that you kind of got? What's the first step of achieving that sound? Brian, you want to take this one? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start it off. You know, that that was, you know, one of the references that Mark gave us. Um, but he also gave us just like old Broadway. And then there were times where he'd be like, I want this to sound like Duke Ellington or I want it to feel this way. Um, and what's so great about Mark and Scott is that they have, you know, an almost encyclopedic knowledge of not only just jazz, but like within jazz, like the sub genres of like, I want this to be kind of like hot swing. I want this to kind of be like, you know, old school Kansas City riff swing. And uh, it gives us a lot of tools and a lot of direction as orchestrators in terms of which direction we want to go. Um, but you, another thing that I, I feel like that's really unique, you know, for Charlie and I is that we really got the opportunity to like play with a lot of different colors and a lot of different sounds. And we also got to know the musicians like on a personal level and really tailor the charts to them. And it's something that's really common to, uh, you know, like the, the, the jazz genre or, you know, the jazz, uh, the jazz library. Like when you think of someone like Duke Ellington, you know, Duke Ellington had the same band, you know, the same players in his band for 20, 30 years. So at times he would write things that were, that would be considered unconventional, but they work for his band because he knows the players so intimately. For an example, like Harry Carney was in his band, he played baritone saxophone. And when you look at the Duke Ellington Orchestra, it's like those Barry Sachs play, uh, lines are in the stratosphere. Like they don't, they're not supposed to be up there. They're supposed to be like down low and, and holding everything down. But he's like, I know Harry's sound. Harry's sound is so sweet and it's so melodic. It's almost like a violin. So I'm going to use him up here. You know, we, we got to, you know, play with that and explore that on our show. Yeah. yeah. It, um, you go ahead. Sorry, I didn't want to step on you, Charlie. You go ahead. Um, I was just saying the there are so many different styles within it because if you think of like a big uh, brassy uh, bright number like the the title song uh, encompasses so much of the jazz age material and then there's really specific character moments like you could have knocked me over with a feather that kind of build along with the character what is do those types of songs feel different do those feel like different assignments to you yeah I mean you know, they certainly do because, um, you know, each character has sort of like their own sound and motivation. And and the thing that makes Mark and Scott similar to what Brian said, such great writers is that like, they utilize genre, these different genres that they have the vocabulary to write because they're so, you know, seasoned. Uh, and they think which particular subgenre of this like mid-century jazz sound is gonna best serve the character that we're writing for. And so then when they make that choice, it's easy for us as orchestrators to go, I see what you're going for. I'm just going to take that. I'm going to run with it. And luckily they gave us enough instruments to really be able to fill in all the colors from those various subgenres. So we're very fortunate. I mean, I feel like there are times where we're trying, you know, to write with a lot of intention and fit within like a certain idiomatic style. And then there are times where we're like intentionally kind of writing against said idiom. Like we're like, you know, wouldn't it be fun to, you know, instead of like dig deep into the conventional like MGM thing here, like kind of write against it and make it our own. You know, I think it's a it's a balancing act. And yeah, and I would say, Brian, like that's kind of what you did with like Brian orchestrated Feather for, in your example. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of like the thing that Brian did, I think, really successfully with it is it it is sort of rooted in that that big band, that big brassy sound. But like it still has like a it has like a contemporary edge to it. It's not too old fashioned sounding, you know. I mean, I can tell you exactly what I was thinking. Like, I wanted to go like full Quincy Jones on it, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, right. Live at the Sands. And, you know, like when I first turned it in, you know, I, I think it was fine. And then as the show developed and Jay's performance kind of changed and, and grew, you know, it was really a note from Scott. And he said, like, it's, it's just developing too fast, you know? So then we kind of went back and, and took another look at it. And I, I took another pass and, you know, it starts off a little more Sammy Nestico, or even you could argue like Robert Gensler, and then kind of gets back to the Quincy thing where we're live at the Sands and there's a the kick line from Frank while someone passes him a, a Jack Daniels, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, with that in mind, how much would you say experimentation is there when you are trying to decide what instrument are we going to hear and when, what tone are we going for, and when yeah, does the big build kick in? Well, yeah, exactly. You're, what you're describing is pretty much, I think, 
what makes a truly great orchestrator because you know our job as orchestrators is to like listen to a piece of music that somebody's written and hear the untapped you know potential in that piece of music based on the instruments at our disposal and the genre we're working in so you know it's, it's like you're saying we have to have all these familiarities with all the various instruments in our orchestras what sounds can they make what jobs they do what emotions can they convey in which ranges and being easy you know and playable and not being an impossible task for the musicians and so yeah it, it's it's a thing that you develop it's a skill you develop over many years of trial and error and doing and doing it so then when it comes time to orchestrate a you know a big broadway show like this ideally you have a bag of tricks that you can pull out and you say well in this genre these instruments do this job to convey this emotion so i'm going to write like that you know so it's a thing that you don't really have a lot of time in a broadway show to think about doing because you have to orchestrate the whole thing in about three weeks so ideally it's a skill you would have developed and a vocabulary you as a writer developed over many years of practice yeah i would say the trial and error occurs uh <laughs> not when you're <laughs> when you're not orchestrating a musical the trial and error occurs when you have free time to write for your own band or you know you have time to to experiment because we just we don't really have a lot of time to throw. Yeah, me, me and Brian both have our own large ensemble jazz, uh, many large ensemble jazz projects that we do personally that I think over the last decade have served equally as our sort of laboratory to try this stuff out before it came for like, you know, the Super Bowl of big band writing <laughs> that is some like it hot, basically. And this show, what has a very lush 17 piece orchestra in order to achieve the sound, you two have also worked on shows with all different types of sizes in orchestra. Like you both uh, were working on A Strange Loop, which is a much smaller uh, scale piece. How does that task differentiate? What What's the difference uh, between working on a really huge orchestra like this and a really intimate one? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'll, I'll take it first, I guess, sure. Um, you know, ultimately, it's dictated by genre of music, first of all, like certain genres of music need more, they have larger ensembles that play them or smaller. But ultimately, it comes down to like, the function of that genre, right? So if the, if the genre of some like a pot is like MGM, big band orchestral things, you have to think of it sort of like, like you have the musicians on your palette, you know, of paints, right? And so you, you want to paint this backdrop of a show and you're, you're employing as many different kinds of paints as you have. But the thing about this analogy is like, let's say you need to use the color, like you need yellow, but you don't have the yellow colored paint. Well, that's fine, right? You would mix red and green and that would make yellow. Is that right? Red and green is yellow, right? But that means that if your, your red and your green are occupied by being yellow, so you can't use red or green. That's how orchestrating works, right? So if you don't have yellow paint, then you, you, know, you, you can't have red or green, which in a big show like this means you have to have enough colors on your palette to be able to paint the full landscape of like the melody, the backgrounds, the string lines, the intermoving French horn, like all these things that make up the genre of orchestral you know, movies and big bands in the mid-century. That's not really as true of a show like Strange Loop, which is more of sort of like based around pop stuff, you know, a smaller sound where like you don't necessarily need yellow all the time. And if you did need yellow, then it wouldn't be as big of a deal to use red and green to make yellow in that moment because you just need it for a little bit. You don't need it the whole time. And it's more about a genre of music that is defined by a smaller ensemble. So it's ultimately the same skills. It just comes from being familiar with genre and having the vocabulary to write in those genres while trying to be as authentic to those genres as you can, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The thing about like writing for small ensembles with me, especially when I'm writing for like the non jazz genre. Uh, huh, how do I want to phrase this? I would say like, it's, it's kind of like what, what Charlie's saying, like there's, there's less to worry about. There's less, uh, things aren't always constantly in motion. You know what I mean? Like, you know, for the most part, if you if you have the rhythm section going, like everyone can kind of like take a take a breather, you know. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, on a show like this, there's just there's so much going on, there's so much to manage, you know. And as the orchestrator, especially when you're like in the development or you're in previews, it, it kind of feels like, you know, your your air traffic control and you're making sure that everyone is taking off and landing at the appropriate time without causing any accident. 
You know what else is a good example? Like, okay, so when this uh, is talking strictly about like chords in music, you know, jazz obviously has much more complicated chords in it, right? That have a lot more notes. You know, your basic chord has only three notes, which can be very easily covered by a small amount of musicians. But when Mark Shaman wrote this show, which is, you know, from the chord vocabulary of jazz, you know, he used all 10 of those fingers and all 10 of his fingers were playing different notes. So if you don't have 10, at least 10 things to play those notes, you're not going to hear all the notes. You know what I mean? So it's just by design, like you have to. And people, I think, would look at our show and they would say, wow, they have 17 instruments. So that means that like they have everything they need when really we're trying to imitate or emulate the sound of, of one, like either a, a big band with orchestra, which is going to be at least like 30 pieces or like an MGM, you know, soundstage, you know, film orchestra, which is going to be 50, 60 pieces. So with 17 people, we're still very much stretching the limits. Yeah. Uh, 17 the is the smallest. Do. That's the <laughs> smallest we could have gotten away with to do this show. It was still like doing a musical Sudoku. It was really hard. <laughs> Whereas on Strange Loop, where it's, you know, what was that instrument? Seven, right? Yeah, seven. It was, uh, it was uh, guitar, keys, bass, drums, a, a sax, a reed doubler, and then guitar, two, keys, two, doubler, six. It was only six. Like, there were, there were moments where it was like, ah, oh, it'd be nice to have strings, but, like, nothing ever felt <laughs> dire. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, like exactly. everything that needs to be here is here. And I, I didn't necessarily feel like that on this show. I'm like, oh, God, how are we going to make this work? Like, we're... <laughs> Well, I was curious if you noticed a, a shift in the industry in that regard, because for a while it seemed like the small scale orchestrations were the thing that everyone was doing. And there's certainly still many shows like that this season. But I think a theme this season uh, across the board has been, you know, many shows with these really big orchestrations and really big sound. Do you notice right. the desire to shift? To yes. That? But how many of them are not revivals? my question this is true. my follow-up question yeah i think i do i do think that it's very helpful that we're doing these revivals and and for the first time in a long time emphasizing oh we're doing the original orchestrations like sweeney todd original orchestrations yes sell that use that as a selling point that's that's awesome you know get people excited about that so hopefully the next sort of like translation of that wave can be hey why don't we write more new musicals with also big orchestras that'd be cool too you know like oh yeah orchestras are great Remember how awesome orchestras are? <laughs> They're awesome. They are awesome. It's great to hear a, a big sound on the stage. Um, well, this one, Some Like It Hot, certainly has a big sound. So Charlie, Brian, thank you for bringing that to life. Thank you for being here to chat about it. And for everyone who's watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep with us the rest of the season. Brian, Charlie, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us.